Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves. I'm your host, Ike. And before we get too sucked in to this awesome interview, do us both a favor and like, subscribe, and share this amazing piece of entertainment, because I am here with the one, the only, Bosch and Roll! What's up, Ike? You can call me Brian for the rest of the conversation, but yes, professionally and publicly known as Bosch and Roll, that's where you can Sweet. find me. So, wait, Brian, why are you called Bosch and Roll if your name is Brian? This is a, uh, a long tale over multiple versions of my life. I have been playing Magic since 97, and the first like real deck that I like opened a magazine and copied rather than just build a 100-card pile out of the crap that I owned, was the <laughs> George W. Bosch deck that won. It was either a Pro Tour or a Grand Prix in New Orleans right after Mirrodin came out, and Bosch oh, Iron yeah. Golem was the the like marquee legend of that deck. And I love that deck so much, sort of adopted it as my identity. Like Artifact combo decks are still sort of totally in my jam, even all these years later. And... My AIM screen name and my first email address were Bosch1624, because 16 <laughs> and 24 were the increments of damage Bosch usually did. Uh, so, like, Bosch1624 was my AIM screen name for years, and then Bosch1624 at Hotmail.com was, like, my first email. <laughs> and then I moved. This was in uh, probably ninth or 10th grade. I made these. Mm -hmm. And then I moved out of state in the summer between 10th and 11th grade. And I started meeting my peers through AIM, uh, just sort of like uh, got somebody's AIM uh, account and then they introduced me to their other friends and everyone only knew me as Bosch because they didn't. They, we hadn't even met in person yet. I spent that whole summer just <laughs> meeting people on like MySpace and LiveJournal and AIM, talking on AIM, and people only knew me as Bosch. And then my best friend... Uh, person who grew to become my best friend her screen name was mosh and roll which is a song by the band barrier dead like a boston area hardcore band from the early 2000s and we thought it would be funny if i was bosh and roll to match up with mosh and roll <laughs> and then that has just been my name everywhere uh for the last probably 15 years uh, just bosh and roll just stuck it it's cool you don't need to understand the source material you don't need to know what bosh is you don't need to know what roll is like it's just like oh bosh and roll yeah rock and roll baby like even if you know nothing it's just like a cool name so it really is that's so yeah. cool i love i love that it that's like one of my favorite forms of just trivia is when on its on its own merit it stands by itself bosh and roll is dope just phonetically and just like within our culture just like those words they just have like a good like sound and feel to them but also with that story behind it it just makes it even better it's kind of, it's like for me it's like binging with Babish. It's like it's such a great name that it's just like on its own merit it works. And if you know that it's like from the West Wing, it's like oh that's so cool too. It's, right, exactly. That kind of fits in that awesome pantheon. That's right. so terrific. Just Magic the Gathering and punk and hardcore music smashed into one sweet name that you don't need to understand either part of it. Like oh, <laughs> got really lucky stumbling into that one and that stuck that's all so these years great. later. Yeah, that's so awesome. All right, back to the pod. First up, I gotta know, what is your favorite dad joke? My favorite dad joke. Okay. What did the octogenarian pirate say? I am 80. <laughs> I was trying to wrap my head around octogenarian for a second. An octogenarian, for those listening, is somebody who is 80 years of age or older. <laughs> Someone in their 80s. Oh, that was awesome. That worked perfectly. <laughs> All right, next up, what is your favorite underutilized word? I went super philosophical on this one, and I went with why. I don't think people ask why enough. Why, why? I think that uh, people lack curiosity in general, and I think that like, if you see someone doing something strange, rather than being like, oh, look at this idiot, you can try to understand what they're doing and you might learn something. I think just everyone would benefit from that mindset better. 
Why, why you gotta Why you gotta point fingers in this direction, huh, there, bud? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I got offered that this is, this podcast totally... guest spot. It sent this list of questions, and instead of being like, "Oh, this idiot," I said, "Oh, why?" But <laughs> no. no, for real though, uh, this this is great, and uh, yeah, people should ask why more. I I totally agree, and that's something that a friend of mine actually said, and I was like, "Shut up." <laughs> and like the more I think about it, it's totally true. So thank you for the great reminder. Brian, is there a movie you will never skip when channel surfing? Oh, that is, uh, there, there's probably hundreds of them. Uh, the rewatchables is one of my favorite podcasts and mm -hmm. the, the entire podcast is just about movies. You don't skip when you're channel surfing and they're, <laughs> yeah. they're like 250 episodes in or something. And, I have not disagreed with very many of their choices. <laughs> What's the most recent non-skip movie that you've watched? It's kind of a, a weird, like, uh, anachronism to, like, talk about channel surfing because it's been a long time since I've had a TV with channels. <laughs> I'm totally. just, like, mono-streaming, mono-YouTube. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I rarely watch things that I didn't seek out on purpose, but... If I was like visiting my parents over a holiday or something, I imagine like Star Wars doesn't get skipped or Lord of the Rings, like any even even the Hobbit trilogy beforehand, like any six of those movies, uh, I mm -hmm. any like fantasy epic, I'm not going to skip that. What's your? Do you have a favorite of the three Lord of the Rings films? It's been a long time since I analyzed them next to each other, but. Mm -hmm. I feel like the catharsis of Return of the Kings got to just count it. Like, uh, oh, that's interesting. I don't, so mo yeah. mo most people are uh, two towers is, is from like what I've gathered. It's kind of like how lots of like big nerds, like big brain nerds, like um, uh, what is it, Empire Strikes Back? Yeah, it's like you know the the time where it gets ooh, you know, it's like it's most dark. But I. I'm on the other side of where you're coming from. You like the ending and the catharsis. I love the hope in the beginning that is fellowship. That's kind okay. of fascinating. That's fair. And yeah, yeah. you, I, I will say I have significantly more thoughts on the original Star Wars trilogy than I do about the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And <laughs> uh, like Lord of the Rings, they're just like great things that I enjoy because I am a nerd mm. in these spaces. But Star Wars is like a thing that I've really dug into and like the whole expanded universe and all of that is tucked into my brain somewhere. And, <laughs> uh, I, I live in a constant duality in my brain of as an adult understanding that empire strikes back is the best of the three, but I can never detach from the nostalgia of young Brian as a child, loving Ewoks, loving Jawa, Jabba's <laughs> palace. Like, uh, return of the Jedi is easily the worst one as far as like yeah. a film. But mm -hmm. uh, the creatures and the worlds and everything, yeah. like, oh, that's a hit same. That, that I can't say no to. Same. Uh, absolutely same. The the Somewhere between the Ewoks, the fight at the beginning, where, you know, it kind of, it, it's the most probably, I don't know about you, but for me, it's like, looking back, the beginning of Return of the Jedi, that fight scene on, like, in, like, above the Sarlacc pit is the most un-Star Wars moment of the series. It's like... Like, he's, like, flying around and, like, doing all these ridiculous jumps, like, for the original, like, Star Wars films and those three. It's, like, this is, like, what is happening right now? Gymnastics? Like, are you – like, it became more that, like, obviously in the reboot, but, like, at that time, it is kind of – it does stand out as being a little weird, but I totally agree. Like, yeah, little and, Isaac growing up watching that, it's the absolute best. Right. And, and like, Boba Fett going out like a chump, like – <laughs> the, I mean, he's got like his own show now and he's a guest on the Mandalorian and all this other stuff and all these books. But at the time people loved Boba Fett for no reason. They were like, Oh, yeah. th this, this badass bounty hunter. It's like, no, he showed up when the work was already done on cloud city. And then he fell in a hole in return. Of the Jedi, <laughs> and that was his entire role in the original yeah. trilogy, but everyone loves Look, him. Look, Ma, I did it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. What a legend. <laughs> All right. What would you say, Brian, is your biggest everyday temptation? Everyday temptation? Uh, probably salty snacks. <laughs> if What's I'm your, being honest. You, I, I, I really love and respect that you are. What is your, do you have a, like, tiered list? Or what's your, do you have a, like, number one king salty snack? 
basically any kind of potato chip is gonna just put me down um <laughs> I, I guess it doesn't even have to be potato chips just chips like tortilla chips you give me some salsa like the salsa <laughs> and the chips will both be gone uh if i <laughs> if i run out of salsa i'll just continue eating naked chips like it's it it does not stop until someone slaps the bag out of my hand or the chips are gone <laughs> <laughs> requires extreme force to remove said object <laughs> it does it it really does it it it's i don't keep chips in my house unless i'm prepared to finish the bag because uh that's very smart yeah, yeah. I, I don't take a little bowl and measure out portion size like no yeah no they're gone it, for me it's similar with ice cream i know that i'm never gonna stop until i finish it so I can't buy, like, big tubs. Otherwise, I'll just have these purge sessions where, right. like, I eat enough for, like, a family of six. So I have to get, like, the micro. Like, I'm actually thankful that, uh, what is it? Oh. Hagen dazs makes those, like, little dollar cups that you can get. Right, yeah. <laughs> at the Because it's the only way that I won't just, like, obliterate and, like, ruin my, like, weight loss goal of the year is if, like, it's, like, a thimble of ice cream, but it's, like, its own package deal where I can be like, oh, it's out, and, like, throw it away and, like, run from the kitchen like, <laughs> like a Muppet or something. Right, yeah, like, I like sweet snacks, too, but I can sit on those forever. And, like, those mm. are just sort of, like, um like a comfort thing to know they're available if I want them. Like I have this yeah. amazing ice cream store just around the corner from me that makes homemade ice cream sandwiches with like cookies and like, oh. the, like chip, which basically, but mm -hmm. not mass produced. And I can like buy one of those stuff it in the back of my freezer and just be comforted knowing it's there for months. Oh, like, like at, so at the sweet. point where it's like, Oh, I'd really wish I had some ice cream. It's like, Oh, I do. And I'm satisfied <laughs> knowing that I have it. I don't actually need to eat it. <laughs> and then eventually I'll eat it, but, but chips, if I know yeah, they're yeah. there, they're gone. Yeah. Do you think some of it has to do with the fact that it's like on its flavor palette, it feels like it almost should be decent for you. Like there's like the kind of, I mean, depending upon how elaborate the chip is, like there is some amount of savory to it. So it kind of like part of your brain thinks like, oh, this is like a meal style, like texture and taste. Maybe I, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but uh, <laughs> I I know that salty definitely hooks me harder than sweet does. It is honorable to know thyself. Growing up, what was your favorite book? Ooh, uh, I followed all kinds of series. Uh, I can't. I don't know that I have a favorite because. I've never reread a book in my life. Like I, I understand the value of it, but I'm definitely like a, no, I read that. I know what the story is. I'm good kind of guy. Mm -hmm. So series that keep me going for years are valuable to me. Like as a young kid, it was goosebumps and anamorphs. And then uh, the star Wars extended universe, the young Jedi series and like any random book. Uh, that's sort of my jam. And I've been reading magic, the gathering story novels since they've been coming out which is you know 96 or whatever the first one was printed i i own all of those still so wait you read that in 96 you started playing in 97 so if the, we have the time around clock did you read before you started playing no i just had a delightful backlog of books to catch up with once i realized there were books so it was probably <laughs> like i i learned magic existed in 97 had my own collection of cards by like like it was like summer of 97 at summer camp then i spent the next year like getting my own collection of cards like summer of 98 i probably had my own decks to play with and then like around that time i realized there were books i could read too and got to work through the backlog oh, that's so awesome so you've been playing since 97 have you ever like quit sold your collection and then come back or have you like not really quit or sold out since I slowed down once when Yu-Gi-Oh came to America, the card mm -hmm. game. Uh, I was into the TV show. I was probably in eighth grade when the TV show came to America and ninth grade when the cards came. And I spent my ninth and 10th grade years primarily focused on Yu-Gi-Oh competitively. Like that's the weekly tournament I went to, not Friday Night Magic. And those are the tournaments I played in. But even during that time, I would sometimes just randomly take my prize packs in Magic instead of in Yu-Gi-Oh! <laughs> and, like, I was never out of touch, but I would say the uh, 
Urza block. I did not buy many packs of. And, uh, like, yeah, like, probably, I remember buying Urza Saga and not a lot of Destiny or Legacy. And then mm -hmm. I remember going hard on Mirrodin. So, like, whatever the, the stretch of time between Urza Legacy and Mirrodin is, it, I was kind of slow, but never, never off. I think that's, like, four blocks, right? We got Masks, yeah. we got Odyssey, we have Onslaught, and then Mirrodin. So there's a three-block difference. Yeah, I, I remember opening a lot of Mercadian Masks, too. So there might have been, like, a little spike oh, in between. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it was actually Skull Clamp Affinity. Like, the deck that people were quitting Magic <laughs> over brought me back. <laughs> I just I just saw that happening on the tables like between rounds at one of my Yu-Gi-Oh tournaments and I was like what just happened cuz somebody just chucked their whole hand into play then started drawing more cards and I was like tell me more and and I was back in the It's like Yu-Gi-Oh but with that. magic cards. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yep. All right, I'm going to ask you a, a tough and soul-searching question. If you had to evacuate your house, what's the first non-living thing you'd grab and rescue to safety? I would grab the binder that contains my power nine in it. Yeah, that makes sense. You, yep. you grab a house <laughs> neatly. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just buy a... you a new one. This one can burn. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Uh, I have my magic collection like extremely like obnoxiously organized. And oh, nice. I think given my wingspan and strength, I could save... <laughs> all of my dual lands, all of my power nine and uh, some other stuff for the road. Like the number of binders I could scoop up in my arms in one grab. And I have thought about this before. <laughs> this is not the first time I've considered this. Oh, that's great. <laughs> the man has done some mathematical calculations. I have. All right. So do me a favor. Clear your mind. Okay. Now, what comes to mind when I say underrated? Underrated. Ska music? Ooh. Yeah, that's a good, a good and strong choice. Do you have, a, you have any bands that are, are popping out when you think of Ska? Uh, the Toasters are probably my all-time favorite band. Um, Less Than Jake has kept me company for my entire like memory. Uh, Catch Twenty Two and Streetlight Manifesto, those two go hand in hand. Uh, a lot of spent a lot of hours with my CD player in those two as well. I haven't heard somebody reference Scott in a long time. I also remember it's really weird. I know you said less than Jake. The only reason I know that band is because I believe they were popular with a uh, a group of high schoolers that were older than me. I looked up to when I first got into high school, and one of them was named Jake. And looking back, I think they were constantly making that joke, and I never got it until oh, okay. <laughs> now that I know it's a band because there was one of the guys was named Jake. Yeah, I, so I think they were constantly making a friends, and I was just like, okay, somebody's less than Jake, whatever. I just like moved on. Yeah, it, you can always count on older, cooler high school kids to introduce you to ska music. I remember I was hanging out with uh, a family friend. They had a kid who was three years older than me, and we were listening to music and he was playing real big fish and I got out my limp biscuit CD and I was just holding <laughs> it, like waiting for my turn. And he was like, yeah, you can put that away. <laughs> so, like, yeah, we're not, not going to turn off. Trash. This. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can put that away. It's such a nice way of dissenting somebody's like <laughs> choice of art. Right. Yeah. You can put that away. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. All right. Do you have a favorite industry secret or a term that's only used in your line of work that you'd like to share today? Yeah, this kind of circles back to my underutilized why word, and it's functional hypothesis, which is kind of the the basis of my work. Uh, I'm a I work in special ed primarily, and uh, I'm a behavior analyst. And in order to understand behavior, you need to understand why someone's doing something. And we call that our functional hypothesis. And you can't make any change with anyone until you understand why they're doing what they're doing. So functional hypothesis is my industry term that I apply all over my life. So to break it down to layman's term, a functional hypothesis is kind of like 
your first impression of why something may or may not be occurring? It is a little more researched than that. So uh, we follow the scientific method, basically, where like you identify an issue. Let's say, uh, for example, a client or a student of mine um, it like flips his desk with some regularity. And then I come in and I try to figure out, okay, why? And I conduct experiments in the environment. Uh, operating off of this problem to try to figure out like uh, what variables we can change to change the result. This is the scientific method at work. And then if, for example, when I approach with work, uh, like I, it's time for your math test, and then the desk goes flying. Like, okay, <laughs> uh, my, I now ha- hypothesize that he does not want to do math. If I can approach with work and that's not a problem, but it's like, hey, break's over, uh, put your phone down, and he throws his desk. It's like, ah, he wants to keep his phone a little longer. So we can figure out, like, the desk flipping is a function of escape from work, uh, mm. and then that becomes a functional hypothesis. And then we can approach that uh, appropriately, which is, okay, now why, based on this functional hypothesis, how can we help this individual? Is the work too hard? It, can we make the work less aversive by uh, some sort of tutoring? Uh, do we need to make the work easier? Is it like, what is the actual root problem now that we know the function, which is escape? So you need to know why something's happening before you can begin to fix it. Wow, that's super cool. It's a great way of like looking at and like, do you ever use that for like your own like personal, obviously like you use that for work and that makes complete sense. But do you ever use that for like, you know, just kind of like, I don't want to say personal issues, but like day-to-day problems all the time. Uh, like once you, you like think about behavior in like scientific terms, it becomes like really hard to get mad at anyone at that point where like you see like, some crazy person screaming at the cashier at the grocery store because their coupons are expired by three days. That person has a learning history of, I've learned that when I scream, I get what I want. Where, Hmm. like, to me, if it were me, I would probably go the other direction of like, oh, wow, yeah, I understand. You're just doing your job. But, like, it's only been three days. Like, can we slide this through maybe? Like, I have learned in my life that you get more flies with honey where other people have learned the opposite. And everything we do is based on our learning history or uh, motivation where if somebody's coupons are expired, but they can't afford to eat this week without them, they're going to go to higher lengths than me where I might just be like, oh yeah, my bad. You're right. You can throw those away. I'll just pay a full price where my motivation is different. So motivation and learning history function of behavior uh, makes it makes you a lot more empathetic to why a person might be popping off uh, or why someone might not seem to care about something you care a lot about or vice versa and Mm -hmm. all of that is always at play in my life and it goes into gaming too where if i'm playing a game of magic and i know my opponent has like fluster storm or red blast in their deck And they pass the turn with mountain open instead of island when they could have left one or the other. And like, okay, I I could think like, oh, this is a dummy. Like now they can't fluster storm me. (laughs) But but like a more useful way is like, oh, they definitely a pyroblast. Uh, Even if I haven't seen pyroblast yet, it's like this deck definitely has fluster storm and spell pierce in it, but they left up red and not blue. This is a pyroblast. Like just thinking about why people do what they do giving people credit that they have some sort of lived experience and what they're doing is based on some learning history uh, makes it both hard to be mad at anyone and easy to understand people. Wow, that's so cool. All right. Changing from one mind exploding thing to another. Is there a piece of advice you've been told over the years that has made the biggest impact on you or that you find yourself pondering even to this day? I don't know about piece of advice, but I had 
I don't even remember where this came from. It might have been from like a sports movie or a, a manager I had in in high some high school job or something. But mm-hmm. the phrase "so what now what" just sticks in my head all the time. Where like, uh, when folk when people are like stuck on oh this didn't go my way or uh oh, th- this was bad, like I kind of immediately jump into so what now what. Uh, mm. like another way to say that is like, don't give me problems, give me solutions where it's like, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to be late for the thing I'm going to because there's this traffic jam, but rather than like, oh, woe was me, I'm stuck in traffic. I'm going to start thinking, okay, there's an exit up here. I can zigzag back roads. I'll still be late, but less late. And like, so what now, what is just sort of mm. a, a mentality that I keep. It's a great thing to say to yourself and a horrible thing to say to somebody else, too, which is kind of funny. Yes, exactly. I was like, uh, I was oh. like oh, God, my car, I got hit in an accident. All right. So what now? What? Right. Exactly. <laughs> it, you have to you have to filter the advice half of that uh, around. Um, but on that, a good piece of advice I got a long time ago is most people don't want solutions when they are when you're on the mm. other side of that and someone's yeah. complaining to you. Most people just yeah. want to be validated. So. Uh, somewhere around probably like age 23, I realized that like when my girlfriend is complaining about something at, at work, I shouldn't be like, uh, like she's complaining about like someone who's like gossiping and causing trouble for her at work. I shouldn't be like, well, have you gone to HR? Have you talked to her? <laughs> yeah. Like they don't, nobody wants that. I've learned, <laughs> wow, that sucks. Let's order pizza. <laughs> and, and that has just, wow, that sucks. Let's order pizza has just saved me so many uh catching the wrath of somebody else's problem just like yeah you're right that that does suck let's order a pizza (laughs) that did that come from a lot of hypothesizing where when you said have you talked to hr and she threw a table at you you went hmm Uh, i was not (laughs) i was not in the uh the behavior analytic world yet when i learned this so uh it, it was nice to i kind of like reverse engineered why that works later but but yeah that was good advice too. <laughs> All right, given the opportunity, what is your favorite personal anecdote to tell? This one is kind of a self roast, which I like because I do <laughs> have a sense of humor kind. about myself. Yeah, uh, I was at Rehoboth Beach in Delaware with my girlfriend a couple of years ago, and there's this, uh, this. These details may be irrelevant to most listeners, but if they ever pay off, you're welcome. Rehoboth Beach is a stretch of beach, and then there is like a dead no man's land in between for a little while, and then there's Dewey Beach, which is farther down the coast. That dead no man's land has a place called Poodle Beach, which has no rules. Like, there's no lifeguards, so there's no safety, but there's also no, like, noise ordinances or dog leash rules or whatever. Mm -hmm. And... We found Poodle Beach almost by accident, and we realized that it's perfect for us. We are a, like, uh, 30-something couple with no kids, and Poodle Beach is apparently an enormous gay destination. So (laughs) we were surrounded by a lot of gay men, and there were no kids, there were lots of dogs, there was great music, and... Nobody was giving me, like, crap about setting up, like, a sun tent on the beach because there are no, like, Mm. tent ordinances. So, like, Poodle Mm. Beach is, like, perfect for us. And we're just, like, in this, like, giant gaggle of gay dudes. And it's great. (laughs) And uh, we were emerging. I came out of the ocean after one, like, swim session. And I was drying off. And my girlfriend was, like, coming up the beach, uh, like, probably 10 or 20 steps behind me. And this middle-aged uh man who had been sitting on a towel next to us like with his husband uh for the all morning like came over to me he was he was kind of drunk and he was (laughs) like oh honey is that your girlfriend i was like yeah and he's like oh hold on to that one sweetie she is gorgeous and i was like (laughs) and i was like oh yeah lay it on me like thank you so much and i was and immediately he just like kind of looks at me and like goes deadpan and he's like so you must be like really smart or something. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, yep. Yep. So uh, that happened. <laughs> I went from like uh, massive self-esteem to zero self-esteem in like one savage moment of shade from this uh, slightly intoxicated individual on the beach. Oh, it's so amazing. <laughs> I love how it's also like kind of guised as a compliment. It's like, oh, you must be really smart. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I oh, feel like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. I feel like there's a comment of my character being made here. <laughs> oh, it's terrific. <laughs> so, other than that little known fact about yourself, what other, what would you say is your favorite little known fact? About myself or about anything? No, no, about anything. Um, it's tough to pick a favorite. I am just a bottomless well of useless trivia, it seems. Um, and by useless, I mean completely useless. Like, I don't mean I'm good at bar <laughs> trivia with all the, like, random facts I know. I mean, like, completely useless. Like, we'll never come up, not even at trivia <laughs> sort of <laughs> shit. And, uh, the... <laughs> the one thing that I could think of, and this is, I don't even know if this is interesting, but, uh, so the American, uh, the, the symbol of America is the bald eagle. And there is a story that Benjamin Franklin argued in favor of the turkey instead of the bald mm -hmm. eagle to represent America. And that's not entirely true. Ben Franklin was so appalled by the idea of the bald eagle being america's symbol that he famously said something to the effect of why don't we just make it a turkey because <laughs> the bald eagle though it gets a lot of propaganda uh from america who want us to believe that bird is a badass it's not it's like pretty small as far as raptors go it's mostly a scavenger doesn't do a lot of its own hunting it's it's just kind of like this dirty little crappy bird that's just sort of <laughs> <laughs> eats other people's kills and uh benjamin franklin uh argued he, he said something like uh it is an ignoble bird or he, he, he just had significant beef with bald eagle it wasn't that he liked turkeys it's that he hated bald eagles <laughs> oh that's so cool it makes a lot more sense too because it's like why would you choose a turkey like there's nothing great about a turkey other than its taste it's a very stupid bird and like all this stuff so that like totally makes all like puts the context in a lot more sense that's really cool right uh, i i believe his exact quote was a, a bald eagle is a bird of bad moral character <laughs> <laughs> it comes to parties not wearing the right dress doesn't bring a dish it's horrible <laughs> right just eating other people's potato salad contributing nothing <laughs> ah. oh that's great all right, I feel like I know the answer to this one, but I'm going to ask it anyway and not answer on your behalf. Fill in the blank for me. This weekend was so great, I spent 13 hours... Playing Magic. Yeah. Easily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With a secondary, a... a secondary answer of binging some show. <laughs> Maybe both. Like, when I'm not recording, <laughs> if I'm playing Magic, I have some show that I'm binging up on my other monitor. What show have you been binging recently? Uh, Billions is... I, I'm just about done with it. Just about caught up. Oh, that's the one with uh, Paul Giamatti and... Okay. And uh, Damian Lewis. Damian Lewis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love that sort of stuff. Like that uh, political intrigue and uh, 3D chess between two people with basically unlimited power. Yeah. <laughs> what if... <laughs> what if Gods of Money got in a fight? Yes. The show. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yep. That's yeah, compelling. Can you think of the most impactful memory of when you realized you weren't so alone in your struggle as a human or were more like everybody else than you had previously realized? I think it's probably when I found my gaming community. I just, uh, or or finding your people. I, I guess I won't restrict it to gaming, but uh, mm -hmm. like like I said, I am moved when I was uh, 15 years old, and that's like a pretty formative time to have mm -hmm. your entire world change. And 
at the time and even now, like my my two big things were gaming and punk music and just landing in a new school. I was dressed like in the the punk uniform of the time. Like it was like 2004, like My Chemical Romance was at the height of their powers and like uh, Fall Out Boy, like it was the pop punk movement at the time. So mm-hmm. it, it it was an easily accessible look. And I just arrived in my new school, immediately had people I could talk to who looked similar to me, and then quickly were able to sniff out the gamers as well. And just <laughs> having... Do you mean no... that literally or metaphorically? That you <laughs> oh, can yikes. Sniff them out? <laughs> ouch, ouch. Uh, I meant it metaphorically, but <laughs> but also, you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, just, so just going to a new state new people a place i've never been and immediately having a at least friendly acquaintance group that quickly became a friend group is it's a yeah. pretty big sign no yeah, it's it's definitely like one of those one of the beautiful things is like as much as there is negative like negative like stereotypes and facts i guess you could say about like the whole click culture Also, like, when you do move or, like, you know, finding your place and having, like, a huddle or a home is definitely, like, it makes a big difference. Like, I've moved multiple times and being able to go to, like, a game store and meet new friends because Magic and you have, like, this shared experience, you know, each round effectively introduces you to a new person. Like, that aspect is definitely just so beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. I studied abroad for a semester in England in college and I just had a friend group as soon as I arrived there just went to Friday Night Magic the first night and they were like oh you're new oh you have a cool accent wow we're all friends now and (laughs) yeah and off we go like still talk to a number of those people today and that was 12 13 years ago awesome is there a moment you look back on in your life that fills your chest with pride or brings a tear of joy to your eye? Oh, uh, I feel like I am, I have been successful at this point. Like I am in my mid thirties now and have been working hard on a number of things for a while. And I feel like both my real life career and my, what I've done with my magic hobby are both sources of pride for me. And I don't know if I could point to a moment, like I could say like winning a star city invitational, winning a grand prix, being a vintage champion, uh, getting my master's degree, uh, passing my, uh, certification board exam. Like there's a lot of touchstones mm. along the way, but I, I would say just in general where I am in my life, I I'm pretty proud of, how everything shook out yeah that's awesome man all right and lastly before before we throw it to a commercial break if you could have listeners of this podcast hear one song of your choosing which would it be i chose for this armed with a mind by have heart that's a song about uh using your brain instead of using your fists to solve problems oh that's awesome i'm really hoping it's now like either screamo or just aggro punk uh, it <laughs> is it is one of those it. two things. Awesome. <laughs> the thing that sounds opposite to the message. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, I love that a medium can say one thing and sound like another. That's yeah, like... well, that's that's all a matter of perspective, because like, true, true, if, true. if you are someone who's like down like the punk and hardcore and like metal alternative tubes the song is not going to feel that heavy. Like you're going to, no. it's like, okay, like there, I can understand most of these words. And like, uh, mm. I understand like musically what they're doing here and it's a style choice, but it's like in like the melodic positive side of hardcore. But if you listen to like, uh, Justin Bieber or something, this is going to just tear your ears off. <laughs> so it, it it's all a matter of perspective. True. I I remember coming back from a magic trip and a friend of mine, uh, we were like turning on music and I put on like, he's into heavy metal. I turn on the hardest thing I had, which I'm sure it was pedantic by his metric. And he goes, dude, you're going to need to change away from this band. I was like, Oh, you introduced me to him. They're good. They're like, they're kind of heavy. He goes, 
this is what I listened to to go to sleep. <laughs> right, and, right. And it was like hard. It was like the hardest thing I had on my Spotify. I was like, okay. Yeah, I, I worked so it really at a. Is very for people to people. I worked at a restaurant in college for a year, and I would work the closing shift a lot. And after the we closed, we would turn on music to clean, and the the kitchen crew, like me and the other cooks. Like one night we had on Metallica, it, which I consider Metallica to be like classic rock, like mm -hmm. not far off from the Eagles as far as like uh, heaviness and like tone and like what sort of mood I'm trying to set. And like one of the waitresses like walked back into the kitchen and she's like, whoa, it's too late at night for this kill people music. <laughs> and we were like, oh, we're, we're unwinding right now. Yeah, mean? this is us relaxing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. And with that, we're going to throw it to our first break. Feel free to stick around and enjoy the totally real commercial. Or take a minute to enjoy Armed with a Mind by Half Heart. Or, if you really wanted to hear a song from a previous episode, check out the playlist on Spotify, Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves podcast, Song Rex. It's a long title, I know. Don't worry, there's a link in the description. Either way, see you in a jiffy. Do you ever find yourself sitting around with an emptiness inside your soul or larger than preferred vacuous space? Would you like to change that? I thought so. Now introducing stuff for when you have nothing to do but important things. Stuff for when you're lacking personality and intrigue. Stuff when the world has taken a pickaxe sized chunk out of your heart. Stuff. And if Stoff no longer fulfills these needs, please don't hesitate to look into our life-enhancing product, Addiction. And we are back. I'm here with Brian. Brian, what is your passion you've brought with you today? I would say education. And we've touched on this a little bit. Um, specifically, special education is what really ignited my passion for education. And I've made that my career and trickled over into magic content creation and just helping people learn stuff is, is a big thing for me. Would you say that your do you view your magic content creation as a form of education? Yes, absolutely. I get feedback through comment sections or uh, private messages or what have you, where people say like, I always thought legacy was scary turn one formats and like mm -hmm. I, I've never played a, a game of the format in my life, but through your content, I feel like I understand the format fundamentally. And I'm just like, yeah. you could not have complimented me more <laughs> <laughs> like that. That is exactly what I want. And I have people say things like, uh, your, the way you explain things is neither above my head nor insulting. And mm. that is exactly the sweet spot I want. Like I want yeah. entrenched players to feel like they're not being talked down to. And I want new players for it to be approachable. And I have leveraged my entire career of being an educator to find that spot. And I'm glad it's hitting. <laughs> yeah. Threading that needle is definitely a, a big ass, but that, wow, that's impressive. So would you say that you're going more like what percentage would you say of the energy you're using to create that are you using to like push it to be educational versus pushing it to be entertaining? Like what, where is the balance for you? I would say that it's probably like 70, 30 in favor of education. Like mm. the, and that's up from probably like 95, five when I started like, uh, <laughs> getting like loose, becoming a performer is something that, I no part part of me in my life growing <laughs> up wanted to be a performer, like being on stage, giving a speech, any sort of that sort of thing uh, mm -hmm. would have been my nightmare for probably the first 25 years of my life. And uh, I have through my my job, like education frequently is performing, like getting in front of a class and teaching something that's public speaking, that's uh, mm -hmm. keeping them engaged. You have to be a little entertaining. You have to. You can't talk above them or they'll fall asleep. You can't talk below them or, or you'll lose them. Like it just, mm -hmm. all of those skills really coalesced for me, like in my mid to late twenties and then adding on the layer of actually hamming it up for a camera. Uh, it, <laughs> that's that I've sort of found that voice in the last three or four years since I started making recorded live magic content. 
That's awesome. So when did you when did you first get interested in like going down a path of education? It was a complete accident. I uh <laughs> like school did not really work for me growing up. Uh I wasn't like a bad student or anything. I was just entirely average in basically every way in my school career. Uh homework never did it for me like it didn't matter like <laughs> what carrot or what stick was dangled in front of me or threatened me with it was just like i cannot understand why i have to come home from school and do another three <laughs> hours of school work like there there is no justification for this and i'm just yeah. not gonna do it and like <laughs> uh throughout my entire college career and everything it was like i would write my papers the morning they were due just like yep. set an alarm for 6 a.m have something written by 10 a.m <laughs> class turn it in like that's sort of how i approached all of it and mm -hmm. it, it just like there was a lot of cracks missing and uh just like through sheer force of ambivalence i guess where like if i cared more <laughs> i would have crumbled or like if i wasn't as just like capable of writing a paper first thing in the morning like if i like I am reasonably intelligent and I understand the material that's taught in class and like I can bang out a paper in two and a half hours and turn it in and get a good grade. But if I couldn't do that, I would have just failed. Like there there's just a lot of what ifs that result in me not probably not even finishing college, where like just some <laughs> not that far alternate timeline. I am yeah. just a different person and I am unsuccessful and uh, life is bad. And I know that <laughs> there are a lot of people who do fall into those cracks and uh, just like with a little, little attention or a little, a uh, little something extra from a teacher along the way, uh, mm -hmm. those people can really be pulled out of the crack and sent on a path of success. And I've had those great teachers who really just like see me, see what I need and pull something amazing out of me for the year that I have them. And then it's just sort of back to like, here's your three hours of homework. And then I'm just like backsliding <laughs> again. So school did not work for me. My plan once I got out of college was never look at a school again. <laughs> but I graduated college in 2010, which was two years after the housing market collapse in America. And there were no jobs. There was no money. My college degree was a blank piece of paper. <laughs> and I just sort of kicked around from just whatever job to whatever job for a little while. And then I saw a posting at a school for autism and ended up applying to there. And after I got the interview, I was like Googling, like, what is autism? Like, I, I, I knew nothing. <laughs> I, I had no qualifications for, for having this job at all. But like, I got in there. And it was what's called an approved private school, which is a place that school districts pay tuition to send kids that they can't educate. Uh, mm. And like, at, if you went to a public school, I'm sure you saw like kids in special ed and you had them around. This is the kids that that wasn't even close to working for. They have to go somewhere else. And in a school like that, you go kid by kid and just a giant team of people converge on each individual kid, figure out their strengths, their needs, and build an academic program around them. Jeez. And they just get to like be lifted up in their own little bubble surrounded by people who know exactly who they are. And mm. that just really spoke to me. And I ended up going back to school, getting my master's in curriculum and instruction and getting my uh, behavior analyst certification and all this stuff. And I'm just like fully in the deep end of special ed now. And just, That's I wish so cool. that the resources existed to do that for every kid. Yeah. Wow. That's so crazy. Yep. So go, how long did you do that before going back to school? Like, I, did they actually let you like <laughs> work in the school with no qualifications or well uh, yeah so the the reality like i mentioned briefly i wish every kid had the resources there's no resources for that either like mm. it really is just people off the street in like 
what's called like a uh, personal care assistant or instructional aid. It depends on the program, what they're called. But these are just like warm bodies where it's like, we just need a set of hands in here. Make sure like this kid doesn't wander out onto the street or hurt themselves or whatever. And then uh, that can go either way. Like either you get like a warm body who's there for the paycheck, who the kid does end up wandering onto the street or hurting themselves. And that person is in trouble or you're just sparked to like, holy crap, this is amazing. How do I Mm. go farther down this road? And I've seen a ton of people who walk in with no experience and then they end up in a behavior analyst school or occupational therapist school or speech pathology, or they're getting a a teaching cert. And uh, Mm. it just like kicks off this entire world. And there's a bunch of branches you can go down within it. Or you just like, you're a miserable person and you don't want to be there and it's not for you and you should get out quick before someone gets hurt. And like, those are the two paths that that can go. Little, is it like learning by fire or whatever? It's exactly that. Yep. There's no breaks. You just go in and you are made for this or you're not. And off you go. (laughs) And it turns out I was made for that. That's awesome. That's such a like fascinating way and like and circumstance to find out like you know your to find your like kind of life's mission that's like so dope right Whoa. yeah i i didn't know any of that even existed before i was yeah. working it with my hands like it showed up the first day and like oh here it, <laughs> here's this and oh i like it also like i love how initially it sounds like you're the most underqualified person in the room but then it's just like, no, you were one of many of the most underqualified people likely in the room like that day when you like first came on. Yeah. And I I did that job for two years before going back to school. I held that job for the two years I was in school. And then for the past seven or eight ish years, I've been the person training that person doing that job. Oh, uh, so are you at the same place that you started? Uh, no, I have, uh, I started at one school for two years. I switched to the other, another school and I spent my two years in, in my master's program at that school. And then I worked as a behavior and instruction support specialist for six years. And I recently just switched to a home-based model where instead of being at school every day, uh, mm. I am now, rather than being an education service, I'm now a medical service. So I'm billed through health insurance and I go into people's homes and provide the same kind of structure and stuff that I was doing in the school. But now I build like a program for their whole life rather than just their school hours. Oh, cool. But you do it patient by patient. Yes. Okay. So it's just you, do you have like a team or is it just yourself? It's mostly just me. Uh, once I make the the program we hire what's called a uh, behavioral health technician and mm. i train that person to go implement the program day to day and then i check in with them once a week or so and that that's like how the model works how many um cases does a behavioral health technician have going at one time uh the however many they can fit in a week and want to work basically like you have to justify medical necessity to the insurance company to get hours billed. And like some kids, I assess their need and the insurance company is like, they can have 14 hours of service a week. Others okay. get 40 hours of service a week. So uh, sometimes the behavior techs, they can work a case in the morning and then they have a case in the afternoon. Sometimes they just work a full 40 hour week with one kid and just depends on yeah their lives and how the cases line up that's beautiful what would you say is the biggest misconception about education especially you know education for your kind of area by the wider world i think the biggest misconception in my specific niche is that the wide world doesn't know these kids exist like you uh see like some sort of like inspiration porn on like mtv if it's like a bunch of young adults uh with down syndrome living their best life in like a roommate situation or Mm -hmm. uh shows like um love on the spectrum or 
there was some other one where it was like some quirky kid with autism or Big Bang Theory, Sheldon Cooper. Mm -hmm. Like people think that autism is like, I'm kind of quirky socially, but I'm a genius in every other way. Half Half a superpower. Right. Yeah. Which is just not accurate. And no. I mean, there are folks like that, but uh, that that's not a real picture. Like the the kids I work with, uh, I I don't even know how to describe uh, their reality without like like to someone who like you cannot imagine it. Like the mm. idea of when I started in this field. In the interview, uh, they were like, uh, many of our kids are nonverbal. And to me, my brain was like, what does that mean? Like, mm-hmm. they, don't, they don't talk much? It's like, no, they <laughs> literally cannot create Done. speech uh, due yeah. to, like, physical or cognitive impairment. And interacting with nonverbal individuals is, like, uh, breathing to me now. Like, I, I know how to, like, you know, read body language or, like, what, whatever it is and help them communicate and communicate with them. But, you know most people walking up to a kid who just doesn't speak and is rocking back and forth. Uh, they're like, what do I do with this? What, what even is going on here? But I'm just like, all right, let's, let's jump in. Let's make a friend. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, the, everyone I've talked to, uh, I know obviously being in the field, I know a ton of special education teachers and, uh, therapists and all sorts of people across the board. Every single person who I work with says, we didn't do this in school. Like these people were not who we talked about. Even people mm-hmm. with a master's in special education were not yep. training for this. And they just don't exist in the eyes of any institution. Yeah. It's so crazy. Yeah, it, it that you're touching one of those things that it it's a cool notion. I understand why they like why Hollywood likes to do it in a lot of films, but like that idea of like savant syndrome or just like autism as a superpower, it's like it does exist, but it's like so much the like tiny amount, right? Of like of the people with autism that are on the spectrum, however you want to phrase it, it's just like, you know, a like sub ten percent amount, not what Hollywood likes to show as being like the overwhelming like majority, if not like you know, only that like being that way. Right. And there is another misconception about my field that I wasn't sure I was going to talk about, but since we're down the hole, uh, yep. The, what, uh, behavior anal- analysis is, um, mm-hmm. in the magic community a few months back, there was a secret layer product, uh, released that benefited a autism treatment center. Mm -hmm. And there was a huge community backlash because applied behavior analysis is seen as some sort of like uh, torture or abuse of people with autism uh, to a fraction of the community. Mm -hmm. And that community got loud. Uh, Turns out that community overlaps in the magic community quite a bit. And it got loud. And then I saw like, uh, major content creators retweeting like don't support this secret layer because it's benefiting torture and mm-hmm. that is that just really hurt me a lot because basically the the core of this argument is uh if you go back to the roots of any science you're going to find some shifty business yeah. and the early days of behavior analysis before it became behavior analysis it was called behavior modification which uh-huh. uh, may yeah. may uh, elicit some images of like uh, electrocuting homosexuals to try to turn them straight, uh, sort of uh, whatever the most horrific thing you can imagine probably was tried in the 1950s or 1960s. And yep. the 1960s were 60, 70 years ago at this point. Uh, most of the things that the anti-ABA movement cite are cherry picked from early days and nobody believes that anymore. Our ethical mm-hmm. codes are 50 years beyond that stuff at this point. And it's just, it, it it's the least charitable version of the most cherry picked things. And yeah. uh, as a field, we work really hard. We work alongside the neuro- neurodivergent movement who are 
uh, adults with autism who have concerns about ABA practices. And we really are like in the trenches with those people, making sure that we're providing ethical care. And Mm -hmm. that's really important to me. It's really important to the field and the misinterpretation of uh, there, there is a small group of very loud people who feel very strongly that it should not be used. And uh, it, it's just really hard to reach those people because many of them have maybe their own trauma uh, associated with somebody who provided uh, quote unquote care to them at some point in their life. And ABA applied behavior analysis is in this like weird spot where we try to push out the principles, like the idea of function based intervention to anyone who will listen. But then those people go do something wrong with that information and they call Mm -hmm. it ABA where it's not like, it's kind of like saying chemistry is unethical and chemists are bad people because some people choose to cook meth. Like like (laughs) that's sort of the the space that it ends up in where you just get some like wackadoodle who heard like something at a conference and went home and tried it themselves. And it's like, they're just whipping chemicals around uh, with their students with autism or or whoever and calling it ABA and it's it just it I have no doubt to the experience of these people who say that they had a bad time and but generalizing it to the field is just like really hurtful and frankly inaccurate yeah I mean it'd be and correct me if I'm wrong but it'd be kind of like if everybody was like oh surgery is just a bunch of demented lunatics and like the example they put up was like Dr. Frankenstein. It's like, yeah, that's one horrific example and a bad person, but that's not all of us. That's one person a long time ago who did a bunch of like crazy bad shit and tried to play God. You right. know, it sounds like in your kind of community, it's like, yeah, there were nutters that were kind of given too much clout and too much control of the wheel back in the fifties and sixties. They didn't know any better. And, or if they did, they used that information very incorrectly and did a bunch of inhumane shit and we you know do not in any way stand by that and we do not you know take like you know we don't harbor any you know kind of um you know that they are devoid of what we now do we no longer you know associate ourselves with them they are not what we do right yeah the the image of like some sweet little kid getting electrocuted with like a dog shock collar is something that uh, uh, opponents like to invoke. And I can say in my 10 years in the field, I have never seen any sort of electrocution device. I have never heard of it being used in like since like the 1950s. And Mm -hmm. uh, none of that stuff is, is like is, is real or happening. And, yeah, that that's just wasn't planning a, on going down this road, but here we are. Here we are. I mean, it's it sounds like it's you know something of a bygone era, you know, from people that were given too much, you know, or not given enough oversight back when, like it was very much. I'm assuming in its formative years of creation, like it sounds like this was like when it was coming around. People said they knew what they were doing, and you know, whatever associations were supposed to be looking over them was like, well, okay. And like, just didn't check. I mean, you can like, I think it's, wasn't it back in like the fifties and sixties or maybe a little earlier. I remember there was a time period in which like people were going around and um, lobotomies were a cure for like a shocking amount of in quotes things and was like relatively accepted by like boards that should have been like horrified i think it was like the 50s or 60s yeah yeah like, you're you're not wrong the prefrontal lobotomy which is yeah. uh you know where they go basically in your nasal cavity into the front of your brain and just lop off pieces that was completely accepted medical practice around this time we're also talking about a time period where african americans couldn't vote <laughs> Like th- this is what was going on in the world at the time that uh, folks are pulling their yeah. their talking points from, and, and it's it was a long time ago and far in the rear view. Yeah, we've we've moved on as a society, and it sounds like as an organization for the better, which is great. Yes, absolutely. <laughs>
All right. Before we leave your passion, one last question. Do you have a f- favorite non-obvious aspect about education, especially education with, uh, is it, is, is your area of, let, let me actually just kind of get this kind of quantified in my brain. Uh, would you say, is your education area just around people with autism, around people with learning disabilities? How do you, how do you quantify it and like say it when talking like at a dinner party or something? I would say it's primarily intellectual disability, okay. uh, which is a different thing than a learning disability. It doesn't necessarily mean autism, but it can be uh, associate. It can coexist with autism, but not all of my students have had autism over the years. Mm. Um, some of my kids just have uh, like cerebral palsy or some sort of traumatic brain injury, or you know, I I, I worked in a with a big spread of affected individuals, but. I, I do have a lot of experience in autism as well. So what would you say your favorite non-obvious aspect of working in the intellectual intellectual disabled learning? Bleh, I can't say words. What What's your favorite non-obvious aspect of working in your education field? I think just the way it's affected the rest of my life, just really understanding that I've got it really good, like Mm. really, really good. Like even when my day's bad, my car breaks down, I don't know, someone cuts me off in traffic. Like I, I'm not honking my horn. I'm not whatever. Like, okay. They probably have somewhere to be. That's cool with me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like I wish you'd given me a little more turning signal, but I'm not going to get road rage about it or just things in general like that. Just, my general level of anxiety and like how tight I'm wound has just plummeted since getting into this career choice. Just Mm. It gives you like new perspective, kind of like opens up your eyes, like the full range of possibilities, positive and negative. Right. Yeah. And just the skills to manage them. Like, uh, I try not to glorify the, the more the uglier parts of my job where uh dangerous behavior is very common like i it was part of my job for a decade to basically endure being physically attacked in various ways like whether it's someone throws a desk at me or just tries to bear hug me into the ground or bite me or hit me like whatever it was like that was something that i did several times a day for 10 years where it's just like going about my business and like oh uh he's popping off right now let's get through this safely and respectfully and uh keep everyone safe and then like once this kid is is done doing what they're doing make sure we you know catch them when they're back on track provide positive reinforcement right away and (laughs) like get this day moving forward like Mm. uh just kind of like spitting blood into a trash can then like turning around smiling and like wow i love how you're sitting in your chair right now you're doing great work to like the person Mm. who just blasted you in the face like uh that sort of rewires a person and like Mm. crises don't really exist to me anymore like i i don't even know what it would take to like have me freak out about something it's just like okay yeah all right information is processed and let's figure out how to troubleshoot it like uh, crisis management it was part of my daily job i'm a trainer of a crisis management system that we use in the field and just crises crisis management in general and like anxiety that might be associated with perceived crisis and just all the things that people experience in their day to day like nothing is going to rattle me so it- Real quick before we move on, you, you were saying that like when talking about your job, especially in the formative years, you you like to you don't like to sugarcoat that as if it's like I wanna not say positive, but just like as like if it's okay. It's just like a kind of negative aspect of a great job that provide that where you're providing a great service is something it's just like part and parcel. Yeah, that that aspect of the job is really tricky because to me it it's like this client would not be my responsibility if this sort of stuff wasn't happening. If mm-hmm. if it was any easier to work with this person, they wouldn't be on my plate. 
And yeah. I accept that. And I don't glorify like the, oh yeah, I got a desk whipped at my head today, blah, blah, blah. Like some people do sort of uh, process the dangers of this job by like telling war stories and showing off scars and stuff. And mm -hmm. I prefer to focus on like, he hasn't thrown a desk in six months because we're doing a great job. And like, I prefer to focus on the positive. Um, when someone is assigned to me and they're sort of like, hi, I'm a new person off the street. I've never done this before. I make <laughs> sure to hit that like a truck though. I'm like, yeah. okay, uh, working with this client, you are going to get bit. It's not a maybe, it's it's a when, it's not an if. Mm -hmm. And like, uh, I need you to, you know, be ready for that. Like I have to hit the worst aspects of a kid first. And then I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, now that you've heard all that, He's really wonderful. He's like the sweetest little <laughs> uh, like snuggle bug when he's not escalated. And, you know, uh, and I I don't like glorifying that part of the job, but it is part of the job. And that's like circles back to what I was talking about when people don't know these kids exist. Yeah. Uh, and when you talk to somebody, even like a romantic partner, like people I've dated who aren't in the field over the years, like I come home with like uh a splint on my finger because like my hand got like smashed into a door or something and mm -hmm. they're like oh my god what 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 do you do do you like call the police when this happens I'm like no, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like go in my desk where i keep a splint because i know i'm gonna need it eventually <laughs> uh, i like first aid myself uh, i'll go to like med express if it's real bad but like no uh these kids don't need the police they need someone to support them through this uh mm -hmm. or like I've had plenty of conversations with people like, oh, you got to you got to quit that job. Like, this is out of control. It's like, no, I love this. That's so awesome. All right. Well, you said there's nothing that could really, you know, anger or trigger you. You know, no nothing is a, you know, end of the world style event. OK, wait, 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 wait. Let's pause. Gonna... Let's pause. Uh, before <laughs> those words end up in my mouth, uh, I am not going to freak out. I will still get angry. I will still get upset. Like I still have emotions. Uh, I'm yeah. not a robot, but <laughs> I, you're not going to see me like screaming at the cashier. Cause my coupons expired. I will find a way to navigate that calmly on the outside. Even if I'm super ticked off on the inside. Well, with all that said, what is your preposterous peeve? <laughs> all right. My preposterous peeve is, when people violate unspoken traffic patterns in public spaces and particularly in the grocery store, like if you're walking on the left instead of on the right, like, so our carts end up like face to face with each other and it's like, all right, buddy, one of us has to back up. I'm on the right side right now. Like sort of, uh, just that drives me nuts. Or if someone is like, if you're in a, like a public space and like shuffling forward, whether it's like a line, like you're going into a sports game or something like some high crowded shuffling type activity and mm -hmm. someone just stops moving to like text and you almost bump into their back or something. Cause they stopped <laughs> moving like there. I do see red briefly. I'm just like, what, <laughs> what is wrong with you? This is a society. <laughs> so nightmare scenario for you would be, you're on the right. Somebody is on effectively their left. You are, you know, checking your list for, you know, the groceries you have to pick up to make risotto or whatever like that. You know, you're looking, you're taking things off the shelf and then some guy moving at a not slow clip bumps into you, you know, you, you get a, you know, you get a front end collision with another cart when somebody's texting. That is like the, uh, that is a nightmare. That's nightmare fuel. Yeah, that would be pretty bad for me. Um, <laughs> I, I I gotta say, it got both better and worse during the pandemic <laughs> because the grocery stores, at least the ones around me, they took basically all of my unspoken traffic rules and spoke them. They put like <laughs> like all of the aisles were one way, and it was like this way traffic only. Like you can go mm -hmm. up some and down others, and uh keep this much distance between people there were all these rules like everywhere and signage and at at first i was like oh my god can it just always be like pandemic rules in the grocery <laughs> store because this is doing it for me 
but can then, it always be the apocalypse? I would like that. I would right. always like the apocalypse. Right, right. Like, <laughs> I mean, obviously COVID's horrible for the whole world, but like the certain <laughs> aspects of it, like getting extra space at magic tournaments and like traffic rules in the grocery store, maybe we could keep those. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so it was great until there were still people doing the wrong thing. And the unspoken rule violation where like, at least I can talk myself down, like, all right, Brian, like this is in your head. Like there's not actually a rule. Nobody's out of line, but then they were, there were rules and they were out of line. And like, I'd be walking down a one way aisle and someone would whip in the back end going the wrong way. And like, we'd end up sort of face to face, grill to grill on our carts and just like a staring contest. And it's like, I have a moment right now to decide, am I the person who just scoots out of the way and lets them through backwards? Or am I going to be like, you're going the wrong way. (laughs) And I never, I never engaged because I am good at managing crisis and I don't need to escalate uh, with a stranger in the grocery store, but definitely the internal seeing red moment of like, (laughs) you are in the wrong and I have (laughs) evidence to support it. It's not just my crazy thoughts anymore. I'm going to tell the manager. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. It's like if we face to face, if we crash into each other and, and this escalates to something where some authority is involved, I can point to the one way sign and you will be in the wrong. <laughs> Those thoughts definitely kicked around in my head. <laughs> Cue to Brian just pulling out his phone and taking pictures like it's like a <laughs> traffic accident. I have proof. <laughs> yep, yeah, just texting my insurance adjuster. <laughs> when did you first notice that this like following the rules especially in like the grocery store was so kind of paramount to you as a person so i have a pretty significant social anxiety and always have and i think it's less about rule following i i think i invented a set of rules to meet (laughs) what i expect uh people to how people to act when they're around other people, like I am very much like a, uh, I don't want to be in your way. Like I, I'm not like some doormat that just lets people roll, do whatever they want and like mistreat mm-hmm. me. But like, as far as like things like a grocery store aisle is made, it is by design wide enough for two carts. <laughs> so you can, people going one way, people going the other can pass each other. That's how those things are made. Not three, not like, (laughs) and and like, so like when somebody just walks up to like the pasta wall or whatever, turns Mm. their cart sideways across the entire aisle and then just like peruses the different pasta shapes for like 30, 40 seconds. (laughs) I'm standing there like you could have parked any other way and I could get by (laughs) you. And like, you are needlessly disruptive to the entire flow of the people around you right now and i sort of reflect that back on myself where i would be mortified like if (laughs) i'm like if i'm ever like at a red light and sort of daydreaming and the person behind me honks because it turned green and i didn't notice i am like oh god i've failed as a member of society (laughs) like that person is right to be mad at me they're gonna take away my residency as a human being of the united states I'm going to get kicked out. Uh, did, is this something that started before you were like when you were a kid? Is this something that like went happened, like started to happen when you were an adult? Do you, do you remember when this like really started to like come full focus for you? I don't remember it not being a part of my life. So definitely from childhood. And oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm comfortable saying all this, like, uh, I, do regularly attend uh therapy like i have a regular therapist mm-hmm. and i think i'm not embarrassed to say that because i think every single person should have a therapist like it doesn't matter uh yeah. who you are or how good your life is going or whatever like everyone has some baggage to work through and i if i can be a, a model for someone to get into therapy <laughs> who might need it like <laughs> uh, i'm i'm happy to say that but yeah like i've been working through this stuff the last couple of years with my therapist and uh, helping figure out like, wow. Yeah. That is an annoying thing that that person in public did without really thinking about the people around them or like, no dude, you're just sort of wound up about specifically that. 
and just <laughs> figuring out which is which and, and like where it comes from and stuff is is really useful to any person who's trying to exist in the world. Yeah. Just got to stop and ask yourself why. Exactly. Nailed it. Woo! Uh, before we move on, do you ever see yourself doing this, getting wound up, you know, chiding somebody, being like, dude, you're going the wrong way? And is it ever something that you're like, am I wrong? Am I like kind of freaking out too much about this? Or are you just so in the moment where like this guy, this, this mook, this piece of shit, like, which way do you usually bend on like your reaction? In recent years, it's, this is not a crisis. I can just back up and like, if the choice is ram into this person who's going the <laughs> wrong way, even though it's their fault or back up a little bit and let them through, like I, am comfortable not being the arbiter of every little detail mm. of societal function. I would rather avoid any interaction with a stranger than like escalate one over some like point of order. <laughs> like mm -hmm. that's just, that's not where I am. Uh, <laughs> definitely in my younger years, like when I hadn't processed a lot of like the anger and anxiety and stuff I was carrying around, like I, I remember a time where like, I asked for barbecue sauce at a McDonald's in like, <laughs> I, I was probably like 19 or 20 and I asked for barbecue uh -huh. sauce at a McDonald's and they were like, barbecue sauce is 35 cents. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like are you fucking kidding me? Like I just ordered, I, I just ordered this whole meal and you're going to charge me for a cup of sauce. Like how you want me to eat this without sauce? And they were like, sorry, it's policy. And I like walked over to the like fountain drink area and I took about a thousand napkins and like 50 straws and like just let the fountain, like just like put my arm across the fountain machine. And I was like, have I spent 35 cents yet? And like, obviously that's like, an un yeah, like that's, that's like an unhinged thing to do. Like that, that is not a thing that a healthy member of society does. And like, uh, these days I would, uh, I would ask like, why it, not to the person like, the kid working the register has no control over the 35 cent barbecue sauce, but like uh, <laughs> clearly like somebody uh, or some number of people were abusing the free sauce at some point, And like the, <laughs> the restaurant was like becoming less profitable and like whether it's reasonable or not to charge for a cup of sauce at a McDonald's, like uh, that is the determination that somebody way up the chain, not presently in the building decided. So uh, like <laughs> going off, uh, in the in the lobby is not the solution uh but but yeah like uh, i i used to have like sort of this like gray rage where it was like you have you have slighted me in, in a tiny way i will destroy you and uh, i i don't really do that anymore you have cost me a cup of barbecue sauce you will pay for this Right. The day I will, will come, I will be eating off remember. your napkin supply at my house for the next eight months. <laughs> oh, and with that, we're gonna head to our second ad break, but don't go anywhere. Because when we get back, Brian is going to enter the lightning round. See you in a bit. Have you ran out of new stuff to do, rendering your life wholly unsatisfying? Do you have too much time on hand and have no idea what to do with it? Or are you just plain over this existence and wish for a plane with more intrigue? Might I introduce you to Addiction? Addiction deals with all these problems and more. Had to meet your significant other's parents and would rather not? Addiction. Had to go to work for the third day in a row? Addiction. Rent? Why not? Addiction. Addiction cannot be held responsible for your choice of choosing to imbibe in Addiction. Any and all life-destroying fallout as a result of Addiction cannot be legally pinned on Addiction. But you're more than welcome to try. And we are back. Brian, are you ready to enter the... I am. All right, put however much time it takes to bake this cookie on the clock. Brian, is there a god? Yes. Shakira's voice in Danny DeVito's body or Danny DeVito's voice in Shakira's body? Danny DeVito in Shakira's body. Have you ever paid more for a meal than you made in a week? No. You're having the best day of your life. What happens next? Another amazing thing or something terrible? 
Amazing thing. Are hot dogs sandwiches? Yes. If you had the power to see the future but couldn't change it, would you use it? No. Pineapple on pizza or fist fight? Pineapple on pizza. Kill the spider or get an adult? <laughs> get an adult. Is there a price for you to give up your passion forever? Probably. <laughs> Kanye? Sure. Which do you max out first, intelligence, charisma, or strength? Intelligence. Did you ever cheat on a test in school? Absolutely. Are we alone in the universe? No. Would you rather have your inner monologue sound like Gilbert Gottfried or Fran Drescher? Gilbert Gottfried. Are cheese its addicting? Yes. Lions, tigers, or bears? Bears. Make the food or do the dishes? Make the food. Is Marvel overrated? No. Would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? Duck-sized horses. Would 16-year-old Brian be proud of where you are today? Yes. Do you create your own thoughts or do you just listen to them? Listen. If you have to only have one for the rest of your life, which would you choose, rice or pasta? Pasta. Is the internet a net positive for mankind? Yes. <laughs> would you put your brain in a robot body if you could? Yep. All right. There's two options here. Shape-shifting, but only into a chair, or super strength, but only when you're super tired. Super strength. If someone you cared about asked you to help them cover up a murder they had committed, would you help them? Yes. Would you rather punch a capybara or hug a boa constrictor? Hug a boa. Would you rather be followed around by someone playing the tuba or someone freestyling jazz scat for the rest of your life? Jazz scat, for sure. Could you eat 37 of your favorite food for $5,000 in a one-hour time limit? Mm, no. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay. But before we move on to your prize, you I, like room. many of the listeners at home, would like to know, what is your favorite food that you couldn't eat three, 37 of in a one-hour time limit for four or $5,000? You know, I. you heard my hesitation on that. I did. And like, we already talked about how I love chips and <laughs> I couldn't not eat 37 for $5,000 of chips, but for chips sure. are not my favorite food. Uh, like fried dumplings are one of my favorite foods. I probably could get 37 in, in a, in an hour, but like my, the like lightning round, like flow state answer in my brain was tacos. And I don't think I can get 37 tacos in. That's a lot of taco. Yeah. There's plenty of foods that I do love that I could eat that quantity of, but if, if we're going with the, the knee jerk taco, uh, it's a no. <laughs> I'm glad you thought about it that much and also didn't think about it at all at the same time. <laughs> yeah. That's how my brain works. I don't generate thoughts. I just listen to them. All right. Well, you've survived. What lightning round question would you like to ask me and in turn be asked of future guests? Would you rather have the ability of flight or invisibility? Um, flight. I feel like invisibility lends itself to like nefarious actions, and I don't believe I have that strong a moral code to like deny myself those billion dollar opportunities that nobody's going to be able to like figure out. I you know did so right. Yeah, uh, like I I don't know where this came from, but like flight or invisibility is sort of a one of those like rorschach tests of like are you good or evil <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, like i it, somebody wherever i heard this question originally that uh, was exactly that it was like people who are inherently good will generally choose flight or people who are inherently bad will choose invisibility and i just i just yeah. i guess that makes me good for knowing that i'm evil because like my like invisibility seems more practical and flight seems like assuming you're the only person with the power like that's the follow-up is in this universe, but since it's a lightning round question, you can't ask a follow-up. But it, the the reality of the problem is, if this is in the real world and you're the only person with this power, I think you want invisibility because if you fly, people are gonna like you're gonna get captured by like the NSA and like they're gonna experiment on you and like try to figure out like you know how you did this and how they can replicate it and make other people be able to do it. But yeah. if it's everybody doing it, 
Yeah, and I just assume, like, in both cases, the maximum desirable version of this like i picture like superman flight where you just like Mm -hmm. leave a crater that you shoot off so fast and then you just (laughs) can like outrun a plane and you're gone uh which like sort of blurs the line with teleportation if you're flying fast (laughs) enough but like an invisibility i'm picturing like me and my clothes and the things i'm holding are all invisible not like i have to get naked and then there's like (laughs) (laughs) bags of cash floating through the air at the bank or whatever like uh i'm definitely Assuming the best of both of these powers. That's <laughs> what you got to do, man. That's what you got to do. All right, yep. man. That is the end of the show. Anything you want to plug, recommend, places people can find you or your content? Yeah, check out Bosch and Roll on YouTube. That's B-O-S-H, the letter N-R-O-L-L. I'm also at Bosch and Roll on Twitter. And those are the, the two primary places you can find me. Check out the Eternal Glory podcast as well if you like legacy or Eternal Magic the Gathering content. And those are the things that I do. Awesome. Well, thanks, Brian, for being a guest today. And special thanks to my editor, Richard Ashford, and my composer, Joshua Gibbons. And especially you. Yes, you listening at home or wherever you found time to listen to this. Time is the most precious commodity we have, and I appreciate you spending yours with us. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, like, or just share it with a friend. Every little bit helps this grow. Or if you already have and are out of episodes to listen to, don't worry. We put out a new episode every Monday at midnight on SoundCloud, YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes at Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves Podcast. And a very special thanks are due to our first Patreon patron, Sabella Yellow. And if you'd like to join said illustrious ranks and have your name read aloud, just head on over to patreon.com backslash Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves Podcast. And remember, folks, ducks have bills. Another name for poker chips are checks, but since we decided to go Dutch on lunch and brunch, you owe me a bunch, and I don't mean bananas. Ciao.